It's a pleasure to have Karen Russell at Hofstra tonight for the Great Writers Great Reading series. Russell is the author of the novel Swamplandia, two collections of stories, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves and Vampires in the Lemon Grove, and the novella Sleep Donation. Russell is so talented and accomplished that her accolades are too numerous to name in full. But I will highlight that she's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Coleman Center Fellowship from the New York Public Library, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in fiction, and in 2013 received the highest prize we have in this country, a fellowship from the MacArthur Foundation. Her short fiction regularly appears in The New Yorker and has for some 10 years since she was just 23 years old. The list of writers to whom Karen Russell has been compared and likened is even longer than her list of prizes and awards. The list includes Borges, Marquez, Calvino, Bradbury, Kafka, Carter, Poe, and on and on and on. One writer I came across described Swamplandia as reading exactly like a Stephen King novel written by Flannery O'Connor. A funny, wicked concept that captures an essence of Russell as a storyteller. Her work is haunting, magical, gothic, visited by ghosts and other spirits, but above all, it is psychologically real and descriptively vivid, capturing often the uncomfortable and painful world of adolescence while negotiating transformation and, and redemption through a somewhat distorted lens, like one of those funhouse mirrors that, that has its way with the images it reflects. In Russell's fiction, a Joshua tree transforms into a woman, a population suffers from an epidemic of insomnia relieved by donations of sleep, dead US presidents are reincarnated as a herd of horses, Japanese girls spin silk from their stomachs, vampires assuage their bloodlust with lemon juice. Though her subjects may seem preposterous, Russell writes with such assurance about her worlds that they are fully imagined and utterly believable while also being deeply felt. As Flannery O'Connor wrote and as Russell has quoted, the truth is not distorted here, but rather a certain distortion is used to get at the truth. Russell is the master of a storytelling that so many of my students aspire to, combining realism with leaps of imagination, surrealism, fantasy, horror even, drawing her stories with lyrical prose marked by humor that allows her to go deep and into dark spots gently. In Swamplandia, she uses Dantean imagery in the swamps of Florida to carry the reader to the nether sides of a certain Americana raising many issues along the way from poverty to abuse to being an orphan to environmentalism to the agonies of coming of age and the loss of childhood and the transformation of home. In short, she raises themes through myth and literary footprint and a style all her own that are real and urgent. Questions of genre, what define it, are, pers are pers persistent concern for my students. In an illuminating interview with Guernica magazine, Russell directly speaks to this, to this, acknowledging herself as indebted to new wave fabulists, Kelly Link, George Saunders, Kevin Brockmeyer. Russell responds to a Guernica question about the line between literary fiction and fantasy sci-fi. I quote from her answer. She says, I know, where is that line? You have so-called literary people like Colson Whitehead writing beautiful sentences about zombies, and then Kelly Link is braiding together every genre. There's a spectrum, I suppose. For me, the term literary fiction means there's always attention paid to language and li linguistic experimentation sophistication. I think it's useful to think of literary books and sci-fi fantasy books as existing on a continuum. Do you know that great Leonard Michaels line? I wanted proximity to darkness, strangeness. That's what I'd say I want from a book, regardless of where it falls on the fantastical spectrum. That suspense connected to a particular human character rather than just some mechanized plot. I want a real encounter with something true and disconcerting about people's natures. Maybe the ambition for anything that aspires to be literature is to provide, this is an old fashioned word, wisdom. Please help me welcome Karen Russell.
So one of the great pleasures of doing something like this is that a writer as tremendous as Martha uses her words to address your words. What an honor. Um, that was so beautiful. And also, I think it is like a funhouse mirror. It's like if you, if you could be seen as generously um, and thoughtfully, you know, in, in the, I don't know, that, that's, the, that, that's the mirror of the reader, right? That's what I think everybody who's a writer in this room is hoping for, just to be, to be seen um, in that way. Let me turn, turn this little light on. Well, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this. I've heard from so many other writers how much they've enjoyed their visits to Hofstra, and I had a great time with students this afternoon. And I don't know if what I'm going to give you guys is wisdom necessarily, but, um, but it's weird, and I hope that you already ate dinner because it is disconcerting, I think. Um, I was going to read uh, from the story called Reeling for the Empire, um, and I don't think... It needs too much of a wind-up, except that I went through a period where I became really interested in Meiji-era Japan, which was this time of rapid metamorphosis for the entire island. They were sort of this sleepy, feudalist island for many, many years, and then were sort of yoked into trade with the West, and in a really conscious way, um, began to ape sort of these uh, factories. So they went from having kind of cottage industries and silk reeling to having these Western-style factories and textile mills. And it was, whoa, that's better. Um, some trace the birth of feminist consciousness in Japan back to this period um, where these exclusively female textile mills um, became the site of all kinds of monstrous abuses, you know, human rights, and the women banded together. So I was learning about the real history uh, of this country. And Martha mentioned that great Flannery quote, the truth is not distorted here. And I never know how to get into a story unless there's some kind of distortion, um, you know, some way to kind of imagine it and make it your own. Um, I'm terrible at historical fiction because I just get the Judge Judy panic attack where I'm afraid of getting something wrong. Um, but so I'm always looking for, so is there some way to kind of make an alteration that lets you um, write about something real um, in a voice that's your own? So that's a lot of wind up. Here is the story. Uh, it's called Reeling for the Empire, and thank you guys again so much for coming here on a weeknight um, when I know you've got so much going on. A reeling for the Empire. Several of us claim to have been the daughters of samurai, but of course, there is no way for anyone to verify that now. It's a relief in its way, the new anonymity. We come here tall and thin, noble women from Yamaguchi, Graceful as calligraphy, short and poor, Hida girls with bloody feet, crow-voiced and vulgar, entrusted to the model mill by our teary mothers, rented out by our destitute uncles, and within a day or two, the drink the recruitment agent gave us begins to take effect. And the more our Kaiko bodies begin to resemble one another, the more frantically each factory girl works to reinvent her past. One of the consequences of our captivity here in Nowhere Mill and of the darkness that pools on the factory floor and of the polar fur that covers our faces, blanking us all into sisters, is that anybody can be anyone she likes in the past. Some of our lies are quite bold. Yuna says that her great uncle has a scrap of sailcloth from the black ships. Dai claims that she knelt alongside her samurai father at the Battle of Shiroyama, Nishi fibs that she stowed away in the imperial caboose from Shimbashi Station to Yokohama and saw Emperor Meiji eating pink cake. Back in Gifu, I had tangly hair like a donkey's tail, a mouth like a small red bean, but I tell the others that I was so beautiful. Where are you from, they ask me. The castle in Gifu, perhaps you know it from the famous woodblocks. My great-grandfather was a warrior. Ah, but Kitsune, we thought you said your father was the one who printed the woodblocks, the famous ukiyo-e artist, Utagawa Kuniyoshi. Yes, he was, yesterday. I'll put it bluntly, we are all becoming reelers. Some kind of hybrid creature, part kaiko, silkworm caterpillar, and part human female. Some of the older workers' faces are already quite covered with a coarse white fur, but my face and thighs stayed smooth for 20 days. In fact, I've only just begun to grow the white hair on my belly. During my first nights and days in the silk reeling factory, 
I was always shaking, and I have never been a hysterical person. So at first, I misread these tremors as mere mood. I was in the clutches of a giddy sort of terror. Then the roiling feeling became solid. It was the thread, a color purling invisibly in my belly, silk. Yards and yards of thin color would soon be extracted from me by the machine. Today, the agent drops off two new recruits, sisters from the Yamagata Prefecture, a blue village called Sakegawa, which none of us have visited. They are the daughters of a salmon fisherman, and their names are Tuka and Etsuyo. They are 12 and 19. Tuka has a waist-length braid and baby fat. Etsuyo looks like a forest doe with her long neck and her watchful brown eyes. We step into the light, and Etsuyo swallows her scream. Tuka starts wailing, who are you? What's happened to you? What is this place? Dai crosses the room to them, and despite their terror, the sisters are too sleepy and too shocked to recoil from her embrace. They appear to have drunk the tea very recently because they're quaking on their feet. Etsuyo's eyes cross as if she's about to faint. Dai unrolls two tatami mats in a dark corner and helps them to stretch out. You sleep a little, she whispers, dream. Is this the silk reeling factory, slurs Tuka, half conscious on her bedroll. Oh, yes, Di says, and her furry face hovers like a moon above them. One second. Tuka nods, satisfied, as if willing to dismiss all of her terror to continue believing the agent's promises. Silk starts as a liquid. Right now, I can feel it traveling below my navel, my thread foaming icily along the lining of my stomach. Under the blankets, I watch it rise in a hard lump. There are 20 workers sleeping on 12 tatami, two rows of us, our heads 10 centimeters apart, our earlobes curled like snails on adjacent leaves, and though we are always hungry, every one of us has a round belly. Most nights, I can barely sleep at all, moaning for dawn and the machine. Every aspect of our new lives, from working to sleeping, eating and shitting, bathing when we can get wastewater from the machine, is conducted in one brick room. The far wall has a single oval window set high in its center, too high for us to see anything besides scraps of clouds. Kaiko Jako, we call ourselves silkworm workers. Unlike regular Jako, we have no foreman or men. We are very much alone in the box of this room. Dai says that she is the dormitory supervisor, but that's just Dai's game. We were all brought here by the same man, the factory recruitment agent, a representative endorsed by Emperor Meiji himself from the new ministry for the promotion of industry. We were told slightly different versions of the same story. Our fathers or guardians signed contracts that varied slightly in their terms promising a five yen advance for one year of our lives. The recruitment agent travels the countryside to recruit female workers willing to travel far from their homes to a new European style silk reeling mill. Presumably, he is out recruiting now. He makes his pitch not to the woman herself, but to her father or guardian, or in some few cases where single women cannot be procured, to her husband. I am here on behalf of the nation, he begins, in the spirit of Shaki San Kyogyo, increased production and courage industry. We have awoken to dawn, the enlightened era of the Meiji, and we must all play our part now. Silk reeling is a sacred vocation, and your daughter will be reeling for the empire. The fathers and guardians nearly always sign the contract, and publicly, the Jacos family will share a cup of hot tea with the agent. They celebrate her new career and the five yen advance against her legally mortgaged future. Privately, an hour or so later, the agent will share a special toast with the girl herself. The agent improvises his tea rooms, an attic in a forest inn, or a locked changing room in a bathhouse, or in the case of our iku, an abandoned cowshed. After sunset, the old blind woman arrives, the zookeeper we call her. She hauls our food to the grated door, unbars the lower panel, and we pass her that day's reeled silk. She pushes back two sacks of leaves. The woman never speaks to us no matter what questions we shout at her. She simply waits patiently for our silk, and so long as it's acceptable in quality and weight, in slide the mulberry leaves. Tonight she has also slid in a tray of steaming human food for the new recruits, 
Tuka and Etsuyo get cups of rice and miso soup with floating carrots. Hunks of real ginger are unraveling in the broth like hair. We all sit on the opposite side of the room and watch them chew with a dewy nostalgia that disgusts me even as I find myself ogling their long, white fingers, the balls of rice. The salt and fat smells of their food makes my eyes ache. When we eat the mulberry leaves, we lower our new faces to the floor. They drink down the soup in silence. Di crosses the room and speaks soothingly to the sisters, and then she leads them right to me. Oh, happy day, I glare at her through an unchewed mouthful. Kitsune is quite a veteran now, says smiling Di. She will show you around. I hate this part, and yet you have to tell the new ones what's in store. Minds have been spoiled by the surprise. Will the manager of this factory be coming soon, Etsuyo asks. I think there has been a mistake. We don't belong here, her sister screams. There's nowhere else for you now, I say, staring at the floor. The tea he poured into you back in Sakagawa, the agent's drink, is remaking your insides, your intestines, your secret organs. Soon your stomachs will bloat. You will manufacture silk in your gut with the same helpless skill that you digest food, exhale. Etsuyo begins shaking. We can't undo it. Surely there's a cure a way to reverse it before it's too late. Before we look like you, is what she means. The only cure is a temporary one, and it comes from the machine. When your thread begins, you'll understand. It takes 13 to 14 hours for the machine to empty a Kaiko Joko of her thread, and the relief of being rid of it is indescribable. These seashore girls know next to nothing about silkworm cultivation. In the mountains of Chichibu, Chiyo tells them, Everyone in her village was involved. Seventy families worked together in a web, planting and watering the mulberry trees, raising the eggs to pupa, feeding the caterpillars. The art of silk production was so very inefficient, slow and costly, until us. The agent boasts that he has made us the most productive machines in the empire. Ceaselessly, even when we dream, we kaikojako are generating thread. Every droplet of our energy, every moment of our time, flows into the silk. I guide the sisters to the first of three workbenches. Here are the basins, I say, steam heated, quite modern, where we boil the water. I plunge my left hand under the boiling water for as long as I can bear it, and soon the skin of my fingertips softens and bursts. Out come fine, waggling fibers. Green thread lifts right out of my veins. With my right hand, I pluck up the thread from my left fingertips and wrist. You see, once you get the hang of it, it's quite easy. Are we monsters now, Tuka wants to know. I give Dai a helpless look. That's a question I won't answer. Oops, I forgot to jump over here. Um, it's really close. While the sisters drink in this news, I steer them to the machine. The machine looks like a great steel and wood beast with a dozen rotating eyes and steaming mouths. It's 20 meters long and takes up half the room. The central reeler is a huge and ever-spinning O, capped with rows of flashing metal teeth. Pulleys swing our damp thread left to right across it, refining it into finished silk. Tuka shivers and says it looks as if the machine is smiling at us. Kaiko Joko sit at the workbenches that face the giant wheel, pulling glowing threads from their own fingers, stretching threads across the reeling frames like zither strings. It makes a stinging music. No cranks to turn, I show them. Steam power has freed both our hands. Freed? I suppose that's not quite the right word, is it? Says Iku. Lotus-colored thread is flooding out of her palm, reeling around her dowel. Here is the final miracle, I say. Our silk comes out of us in colors. There's no longer any need to dye it. There is no other silk like it on the world market, boasts the agent. If you look at it from the right angle, a pollen seems to rise up and swirl into your eyes. Nobody has ever guessed her own color correctly. Hoshi predicted hers would be peach and it was blue. Nishi thought pink got hazel. You know, I would have bet my entire advance that mine would be light gray like my cat's fur. But I woke up and pushed the swollen webbing of my thumb and a sprig of green came out. On my day zero, in the middle of my terror, I was surprised into a laugh. Here was a translucent green I'd swore I'd never seen before in nature, and yet on sight I knew it as my own. 
It's as if the surface is charged with our aura, says Hoshi, counting syllables on her knuckles for her next haiku. About this, I don't tease her. I'm no poet, but I'd swear to the silk strange glow. The sisters seem to agree with me. One looks like she's about to faint. Courage, sisters, sings Hoshi. Hoshi is our haiku laureate. She came from a school for young noblewomen and pretends to have read every book in the world. We all agree that she is insufferable. Our silks are sold in Paris and America. They are worn by the emperor himself. The agent tells me we're the treasures of the realm. Hoshi's white whiskers extend nearly to her ears now. Hoshi's optimism is indefatigable. That girl was hairy when she got here, I whisper to the sisters, if you want to know the truth. All of Japan is undergoing a transformation. We Kaiko Jako are not alone in that respect. I watched my grandfather become a sharecropper on his own property, a dependent. He was a young man when the black ships came to Edo. He grew foxtail millet and red buckwheat. Half his crop he paid in rent, two-thirds, and finally, after two bad harvests, his entire yield. That year, our capital moved in a ceremonial and real procession from Kyoto to Tokyo, the world shedding names under the carriage wheels, and the teenage emperor in his palaquin traveling over the mountains like an imperial worm. In the first decade of the Meiji government, my grandfather was forced into bankruptcy. He joined the farmers' revolt in Chubu, and along with hundreds of others of the newly bankrupted and dispossessed, he set fire to the creditors' offices where his debts were recorded. After the rebellion failed, he hanged himself in our barn. The gesture was meaningless. The debts still existed, of course. My father inherited the debts of his father, and there was no dowry for me. In my 23rd year, my mother died, and my father turned white, lay flat. Death seeded in him and began to grow tall like grain, and my brothers carried father to the Inoba Shrine for the mountain cure. It was at precisely this moment that the recruitment agent arrived at our door. The agent visited after a thunder shower. He had a parasol from London, and I had never seen such a handsome person in my life, man or woman. He had blue eyelids, a birth defect, he said, but it had worked out to his extraordinary advantage. He let me sniff his vial of French cologne, and it was as if a rumor had materialized inside the dark interior of the farmhouse. He wore a Western dress. He had, and I found this incredibly appealing, mid-ear sideburns and a mustache. My father is sick, I told him. I was alone in the house. He's in the other room, sleeping. Well, let's not disturb him. The agent stood to go. I can read, I blurted. For years I'd worked as a servant in the summer retreat of a Kobe family. I can write my name. Show me the contract, I begged him, and he did. I could not run away from the factory and I couldn't die either, explained the agent, and perhaps I looked at him a little dreamily because he repeated this injunction in a hard voice, tightening up the grammar. If you die, your father will pay. He was peering deeply into my face. It was April and I could see rain in his mustache. I met his gaze and giggled, embarrassing myself. Look at you, blinking like a firefly, only it is very serious. He lunged forward and grabbed playfully at my waist, causing my entire face to darken in what I hoped was a womanly blush. The agent, fearful that I was choking on a radish, thumped my back. There, there, Kitsune, you will come with me to the model factory, and you will reel for the realm for your emperor. For me too, he added softly with a smile. I nodded, very serious myself now. He let his fingers brush softly against my knuckles as he drew out the contract. Let me bring it to father, I told the agent. Stay here. His disease is contagious. The agent laughed and said he wasn't used to being bossed by a Jaco, but he waited, and who knows if he believed me. My father would never have signed this document. He would not have agreed to let me go. He blamed the new government for my grandfather's death. He was suspicious of foreigners. He would have demanded to know certainly where the factory was located. But I could work, whereas he could not. I saw my father coming home cured and finding the five yen advance. I had never used an ink pen before. In my life as a daughter, I had never felt so powerful. No woman in Gifu had ever brokered such a deal on her own. Kitsune Tajima, I wrote in the slot for the future worker's name, my heart pounding in my ears. When I returned it, I apologized for my father's unsteady hand. On our way to the tea ceremony, I was so excited I could barely make my questions intelligible. He took me to a summer guest house in the woods behind the Mia River 
which he told me was owned by a Takayama merchant family and, at this moment, empty. Oh, something is wrong, I knew then. This knowledge sounded with such clarity that it seemed almost independent of my body, like a bird calling once over the trees. But I proceeded following the agent up a dim staircase. The first room I glimpsed was elegantly furnished, and I felt my spirits lift again along with my caution. I counted 14 steps to the first landing, and he opened the door onto a room that reflected none of the downstairs refinement. There was a table with two stools, a bed, otherwise the room was bare. I was surprised to see a large brown blot on the mattress. One porcelain teapot and one cup. The agent lifted the tea with an unreadable expression, frowning into the pot, and as he poured, I heard a little splash. He cursed, and he excused himself, and he said he needed a fresh ingredient. I heard him continue up the staircase, peered into the cup, and I saw there was something alive inside it, writhing, dying, a fat white kaiko. I shuddered, but I didn't fish it out. What sort of tea ceremony was this? Maybe, I thought, the agent is testing me to see if I am squeamish or weak. Something bad was coming. The stench of a bad and thickening future was everywhere in the room. The bad thing was right under my nose, crinkling its little legs at me but I pinched my nostrils shut just as if I was standing in mud, a heartbeat from jumping into the river, and without so much as consulting the agent, I squinched my eyes shut and gulped. Do you know, the other workers cannot believe I did this willingly. Apparently, one sip of the kaiko tea is so venomous that most bodies go into convulsions. Only through the agent's intervention were they able to get the tea down. It took his hands around their throats. I arranged my hands in my lap, and I sat on the cot. Already, I was feeling a little dizzy. I remember smiling with a sweet vacancy at the door when he returned. You drank it? I nodded proudly, and I saw a look of pure amazement pass over his face. Oh, I passed the test, I thought happily. Only it wasn't that quite. He began to laugh. No, Jaco, he sputtered, not one of you ever. Now he was rolling, his eyes moving towards the room's corners, as if he regretted that the hilarity of this moment was wasted on a girl like me. No one has ever gulped a pot of it. Already the narcolepsy was buzzing through me, like a hive of bees stinging me to sleep. I lay guiltily on the mat. Why couldn't I sit up? Now the agent would think I was worthless for work. I opened my mouth to explain I was feeling ill, but only a smacking sound came out. I held my eyes open for as long as I could stand it, and even then, I was still dreaming of my prestigious new career as a reeler. Under the Meiji government, the hereditary classes had been abolished, and I let myself imagine that this agent might marry me and pay off my family's debts. As I watched, the agent's genteel expression underwent a complete transformation. Suddenly, it was blank as a stump. The last thing I saw before shutting my eyes was his face. I slept for two days, and I woke on a dirty tatami in this factory with Dai applauding me. The green thread had erupted through my palms in my sleep, the metamorphosis unusually accelerated. I was lucky, as Chiyo says. Unlike Tuka and Atsuyo and so many of the others, I had no limbo period, no cramps from my guts unwinding, changing, no time at all to meditate on what I was becoming, a secret, a furred and fleshy silk factory. Many workers here have proof of their innocence, some physical trace on the body, scar tissue, a brave spot, a sign of struggle that is ineradicable. Some girls will push their white fuzz aside to show you. Dai's pocked hands. Mitsuki's rope burns around her neck. Jin has wiggly lines around her mouth like lightning where she was scalded by the tea. And me? There was a moment at the bottom of the stairwell and a door that opened back into the woods. I alone, it seems, out of these 22 workers, signed my own contract. Why did you drink it, Kitsune? I shrug. I was thirsty. Roosters begin to crow outside the walls of Nowhere Mill at 5 a.m. They make a sound like gargled light, very beautiful, which I picture as Dai's Red and Jin's Orge and Yoshi's Pink Thread singing on the world's largest reeler, Dawn. I've been lying awake for hours. Kitsune, you never sleep. I hear the way you breathe, Dai says. I sleep a little. What stops you? Dai rubs at her belly sadly. Too much thread? No, it's up here. I knock on my head. I can't stop reliving it. The agent walking through our fields under his parasol, the rain. You should sleep, says Dai. You do not look well. Mid-morning, there is a malfunction. 
Some hitch in the machine causes my reeler to spin backward, pulling the thread from my fingers so quickly I'm jerked onto my knees and I'm dragged across the floor towards the machine like an enormous flopping fish. The room fills with my howls. With a surprising calm, I become aware that my right arm is on the point of being wrenched from its socket. I lift my chin and begin with a naturalness that belongs entirely to my terror to swivel my head around and bite blindly at the air. At last, I snap the threads with my kaiko jaws and fall sideways. Under my wrist, more thread kinks and scrags. There is a terrible stinging in my hands and my head. My eyes close, and for some reason I see the space beneath my mother's cedar chest where the moonlight lay in green splashes on our floor. As a child, I'd hide there and sleep so soundly that no one in our house could ever find me. No such luck today. Hands latch me back. Voices call my name. Kitsune, are you awake? Are you okay? I'm just clumsy, I laugh, but then I look down at my hand where short threads extrude from the bruised skin. They are the wrong color. Not my green, but ash. Suddenly, I feel short of breath again, and it gets worse when I look up. The silk that I reeled this morning is bright green, but the more recent thread drying on the reeler is black. Black as the sea, as the forest is night, says Hoshi ceremoniously. She is too courteous to make the sinister comparisons. Am I sick? It occurs to me that five or six of these threads drag my entire weight. I'm not worried, says Dai in her too friendly way, clapping my shoulder. Kitsune just needs sleep. But everybody is staring at the spot midway up the reel where the green silk shades into black. My next mornings are spent splashing through the hot water basin, looking for fresh fibers. I pull out yards of the greenish black thread, soiled silk, hideous, useless for kimonos. I sit and reel for my 16 hours until the machine gets the last of it out of me with a shudder. My thread is green three days out of seven, and after that, I'm lucky to get two green outflows in a row. This transformation happens to me alone. None of the other workers report a change in their colors, so I realize this is my illness, not Kaiko evolution. If we had a foreman here, he would quarantine me. He would destroy me, the way silkworms infected with the blight are burned in Kitamura. And in Gifu? Perhaps my father has died at the base of Mount Inaba. Or has he made a full recovery and journeyed home with my brothers and cried in joyful astonishment to find the five yen advance? Let it be that, I pray. My afterlife will be whatever he chooses to do with that money. Today marks the 42nd day since we last saw the agent. In the past, he has reliably surprised us with visits, once or twice per month. Factory inspections, he calls them, scribbling notes about the progress of our transformations, the changes in our weights and shape, the quality of our silk. He's never stayed away so long before. The thought of the agent, either coming or not coming, makes me want to wretch. Water sloshes in my head. I lie on the mat with my eyes shut tight, and I watch the tea splash into the cup. I hear you, Kitsune. I know what you're doing. It's die. You didn't sleep. You have to stop thinking about it. You are making yourself sick. Die. I can't. Today my stomach is so full of thread I'm not sure I'll be able to stand, and I'm afraid that it will all be black. Some of the girls are now forced to crawl on hands and knees to the machine, toppled by their ungainly bellies. I can smell the basins heating. A thick, greasy steam fills the room. I peek up at Dai's face, and I let my eyes flutter shut again. Smell that, I say, more nastily than I intend. In here... We're dead already. Unwinding one cocoon for an eternity, she snarls, as if you had only a single memory, reeling in the wrong direction. Dies angrier than I've ever seen her. She's the big mother, but she's also a samurai's daughter, and sometimes that combination gives rise to a ferocious kind of caring. She's tender with the little ones, but if an older Jaco plummets into a mood or ill health, she'll scream until our ears split. The others also suffered in their past, she says, but we sleep. We get up, we go to work, some crawl forward if there's no other way. I'm not like them, I insist, hating the baleful note in my voice. Sleep can't wipe me clean. I chose this fate. I can't blame a greedy uncle, a gullible father. I drank the tea of my own will. Your will, says Di, so slowly that I'm, assured, I'm sure she's about to mock me, and then her eyes widen with something like joy. So use that to stop drinking the tea at night. Use your will to stop thinking about the agent. She smiles down like she's won the argument. Oh, very simple, I laugh. I'll just stop. Why didn't I think of that? Say, here's one for you. Stop reeling for the agent at your workbench. Stop making the thread in your gut. Try that, and I'm sure you'll feel better. Then we're shouting at each other, and it's our first true fight. 
Die doesn't understand that this memory reassembles itself in me mechanically, just as the thread swells in our new bodies. It's nothing I control. I see the agent arrive, my hand trembling, my ink lacing the name across the contract. Go reel for the Empire Die, make more silk for him to sell. Go throw the little girls another party and make believe that we're not slaves here. Die storms off and I feel a mean little pleasure. For two days we don't speak until I worry we never will again. And on the second night Die finds me, she leans in and whispers that she has accepted my challenge. And I am so happy to hear her voice that I only laugh, take her hand. What challenge? What are you talking about? I thought about what she said, she tells me. She talks about her samurai father's last stand, the Satsuma Rebellion. In the countryside, she says, there are peasant armies who protest the blood tax, refuse to sow new crops. I nod with my eyes shut, watching my grandfather's hat floating through our fields in Gifu. And you're right, Kitsune, we have to stop reeling. If we don't, he'll get every year of our futures. He will get our last breaths. The silk belongs to us, we make it, and we can use that to bargain with the agent. The following morning, Di announces that she won't move from her mat. I'm on strike, no more reeling. By the second day, her belly has grown so bloated with thread that we are begging her to work. The mulberry leaves arrive, and she refuses to eat them. Join me, Di beg begs us, and our eyes dull and lower we sway. For five days, she doesn't reel. She never eats. Some of us, I'm sure, don't mind the extra fistful of leaves. During our break, I bring Di to my blanket. I try to squeeze water onto her tongue, which she refuses. She does not make a sound, but I hiss. Her belly is grotesquely distended and stippled with lumps. Her excess thread is packed in knots, strangling Dai from within. Dai, start reeling again. We all beg. Get some rest, Kitsune. Stop poisoning yourself on the stairwell. If I can stop reeling, surely you can too. When she dies, all the silk is still stubbornly housed in her belly. Stolen from the factory, as the agent alleges. This girl died a thief. He strides over to die and touches her belly with a stick. Well, perhaps we can still salvage some of it, he grumbles, rolling her into his sack. A great sadness settles over our whole group and does not lift. What the agent carried off with Dai was everything we had left. Chiyo's clouds and mountains, my farmhouse, Etsuyo's fiancé. It's clear to us now that we can never leave this room. We can never be away from the machine. Unless we live here where the machine can extract the thread from our bodies, the silk will build and build and kill us in the end. Dai's experiment has taught us that. You never hear a peep in here about the new year anymore. I'm eating, I'm reeling, but I too appear to be dying. My thread is almost totally black. The denier is too uneven for any market. In my mind, I talk to Dai about this, and she's so reassuring. It will be fine, Kitsune but you have to stop. Stop thinking about it. This was her final entreaty to me. Still, I'm not convinced that you were right, Di, that it's such a bad thing, a useless enterprise, to reel out one's memory at night. Some part of me, the human part of me, is kept alive by this, I think, like water flushing a wound to prevent it from closing. I am a lucky one, like Chio says. I made a terrible mistake. In Gifu, in my raggedy clothes, I had an unreckonable power. I did not know that at the time, but when I return to the stairwell now, I can feel them webbing around me, my, forgive me, webbing around me, my choices, their infinite variety, spiraling out of my hands, my invisible thread. Regret is a pilgrimage back to a place where I was free to choose. It's become my sanctuary here in Nowhere Mill, the threshold where I still exist. One morning, two weeks after Dai's strike, I start talking to Chio about her family's cottage business in Chichibu. Chio complains about the smells in her dry attic where they destroy the silkworm larva in vinegary solutions. Why do they do that? I've never heard this part before. Oh, to stop them from undergoing the transformation, Chio says. First the silkworms stop eating and then they spin cocoons. Once inside they'll molt several times and they grow wings and teeth. If the caterpillars are allowed to evolve, they change into moths, and the moths bite through the silk, and they fly off, ruining it for the market. Teeth and wings, wings and teeth, I hear all day under the whine of the cables. The weaving comes so naturally to me that I'm barely aware I'm doing it, humming as if in a dream. But this weaving is instinctual. What takes effort, what requires a special kind of concentration, is generating the right density of thread. To do so, 
I have to keep forging my father's name in my mind, climbing the stairs, watching the mistake unfurl. I drink the toxic tea and feel it burn my throat. I lie flat on the cot while my organs are remade for the factory, thinking only, yes, I chose this. When these memories send the fierce regret spiraling through me, I focus on my heartbeat and my throbbing palms. Fibers stiffen inside my fingers. Grow strong, I direct the thread. Go black, lengthen, stick. And then, when I return to the vats, what I've produced is exactly the necessary darkness. I sit at the workbench at my ordinary station, and I am so happy to discover that I can do all this myself. The silk generation, the separation, the dyeing, the reeling. Out of the same intuition, I discover that I know how to alter the machine. Help me, Suki, I say, because I want her to watch what I'm doing. I begin to explain, but already she is disassembling the reeler. I know, Kitsune, she says. I see what you have in mind. Words seem to be unnecessary now between me and Suki. We beam thoughts soundlessly across the room. Perhaps speech will be the next superfluity here in nowhere mill. Another step we Kaiko girls can skip. It takes me 10 hours to spin the black cocoon. The first girls who see it take one look and run back to the tatami. The second girls are cautiously admiring. Hoshi waddles over with her belly full of blue silk and she screams. I am halfway up the wall of nowhere mill before I realize what I'm doing. Then I'm parallel to the woodpecker's window. The gluey thread collected on my palm sticks me to the glass. For the first time, I can see outside. A blue eternity. Oh, we will have wings soon, I think. And ten feet below me, I hear Suki laugh out loud. I attach the cocoon to a wooden beam, and soon I am floating in circles over the machine, suspended by my own black line. Come down, Hoshi yells, but she's the only one. I secure the cocoon, and then I let myself fall. My entire weight suspended by one thread. The cocoon sways over the machine, a furled black flag creaking slightly, and I think of my grandfather hanging by the thick rope from our barn door. More black thread spasms down my arms. Kitsune, please, you'll make the agent angry. You should not waste your silk this way. Don't forget the trade. It's silk for food. What happens when he stops feeding us? But in the end, I convince every girl to join me. Instinct obviates the need for a lesson. Swiftly, the others discover that they too can change their thread from within using the colors and seasons of their memories. Before we can begin to weave our cocoons, however, we work night and day and night and day to reel the ordinary silk, doubling our production, stockpiling the surplus. Then we seize control of the machinery of Nowhere Mill. We spend the next six days dismantling and reassembling the machine, using its gears and reels to speed the production of our own shimmering cocoons. Each dusk, we continue to deliver the regular number of silks to the zookeeper to avoid arousing suspicion. When we are ready for the next stage of the revolution, only then will we invite him to tour the factory floor. Silkware moths develop long ivory wings, says Chio, bronzed with ancient designs. Do they have antenna, mouths? Can they see? Who knows what the world will look like if our strike succeeds? I believe we will emerge from it entirely new creatures. We'll have to wait and learn what we've become when we get out. The old blind woman really is blind, we decide. She squints directly at the wrecked and rerouted machine, and she waits with her arms extended for one of us to deposit the silk. Instead, Hoshi pushes a letter through the grate. We don't have any silk today. Bring this to the agent. Go tell him. The agent comes the very next night. Hello? He raps at our grated door with a stick, but remains in the threshold. For a moment, I'm sure that he won't come in. They're gone, they're gone, I wail, rocking. What? The grate slides open, and he steps onto the factory floor, into our shadows. Yes, they've all escaped, every one of them, all your kaikojuko. Now my sisters drop down on their threads. They fall from the ceiling on whistling lines of silk, swinging into the light, and I feel as though I'm dreaming. It is a dreamlike repetition of our initiation when the agent dropped the infecting Kaiko into the orange tea. Watching his eyes widen and his mouth stretch into a scream, I too am shocked. We have no mirrors here in Nowhere Mill. I've spent the past few months convinced that we were still identifiable as girls, women, no beauty queens, certainly, shaggy and white, but at least half human 
And it's only now, watching the agent's reaction, that I realize what we've become in his absence. I see us as he must. White faces with sunken nose that are partially erased. Eyes insect huge. Spines and elbows incubating lace for wings. My muscles tense, and then I am airborne, launching myself onto the agent's back. For a second, I get a thrilling sense of what true flight will feel like once we complete the transformation. I alight on his shoulders and hook my legs around him. The agent grunts beneath my weight, staggers forward. These wings of ours are invisible to you, I say directly into the agent's ear. I clasp my hands around his neck, lean into it. And in fact, you will never see them. Since they exist only in our future, where you are dead and we are living, flying. I then turn the agent's head so that he can admire our silk. For the past week, every worker has used the altered machine to spin her own cocoon. They hang from the far wall, coral and emerald and blue, ordered by hue like a rainbow. While the rest of Japan changes outside the walls of Nowhere Mill, we'll hang side by side, hidden against the bricks, passing into our next phase. Then we'll escape. And look, I say, counting down the wall, 21 workers and 22 cocoons. When he sees the black sack, I feel his neck stiffen. We have spun one for you. I smile down at the agent who is stumbling beneath me, babbling something that I admit I make no great effort to understand. The glue sticks my knees to his shoulders. Several of us busy ourselves with getting the gag in place, and this is accomplished before the agent can scream once. Jin and Nishi bring down the cast iron grate behind him. The slender agent is heavier than he looks. It takes four of us to stuff him into the sock-like cocoon. I smile at the agent and I instruct the others to leave his eyes for last, thinking that he will be so very impressed to see our, silk, our skillet reeling up close. Behind me, even as this attack is underway, the other Kaikojoko are climbing into their cocoons. Already there are girls half swallowed by them, winding silk threads over their knees, sealing the outermost layer. Now our methods regress a bit. They get a little old fashioned. I reel the last of the black cocoon by hand. Several Kaiko Jako have to hold the agent steady so that I can orbit him with the thread. I spin around his chin and his cheekbones, his lips. To get over the mustache requires several revolutions. Bits of my white fur drift down and disappear into his nostrils. His eyes are huge and black and void of any recognition. I whisper my name to him to see if I can shake my old self loose from his memory, Kitsune Tajima of Gifu Prefecture. But there's nothing. So then I continue reeling upward, naming the workers of Nowhere Mill all the while, Nishi, Yoshi, Yuna, Uki, Etsuyo, Jin, Hoshi, Raku, Chikoyo, Mitsuko, Saiko, Tuka, Dai. Kitsune, I repeat, closing the circle. And the last thing I see before shutting his eyes is the reflection of my shining new face. That's it. Thanks, guys. I know that some... Uh, Somebody who's fluent in Japanese is going to come up to me after this, and I'm so, just, <laughs> I apologize for the trauma those pronunciations caused. Um, I, think, I think I take questions now, right? Okay, just checking. This road to being very unusual in your writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bet you're, you said she's, a, she's another writer who's a weirdo. This is a friend of yours. Yeah. 
Who can say how it happened? I, I blame Florida. I'm from South Florida, so I she like to just say. blame geography she, a lot. She doesn't exactly know, but she asked her parents if she could wear black when she was seven, and her first boyfriend was Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> so. See, I was too much of a social coward to ever, you know, nothing ever manifested aesthetically. I just shopped at the Gap and tried to be inoffensive. You know, it wasn't a, I don't, and I, you know, not too many goths in South Florida. It's too hot. We, <laughs> we'd all just be wearing black shorts. Um, <laughs> But I think, I think I just always listed towards the weird stuff as a reader. You know, I think you can be really influenced by what you read, too. So um, somehow the stories, the sanitized stories you're supposed to read, they didn't really feel like the fullest capture of how strange it is just to be alive on any, on any day. And um, so I love, you know, I had a deal with my mom where I could go to the library. I could get like a Stephen King or Ray Bradbury or Frank Herbert or someone wilder. And then I had to get like The Count of Monte Cristo. But unbeknownst to my mom, all of those books also had ghosts and horror. So, you know, it, um, so I, I think Martha was saying it's kind of a blurry line, right? I, it's, it is sort of on a continuum. But I, I just read weird stuff, and I also grew up in Miami. So that's my, that's my ex. Yeah. I read this story recently, and someone asked me if I had ever had a hernia. They were like, that's kind of what it feels like. And I was like, I can't, <laughs> can't speak to that. Hello. Hi, Kelly. We were talking earlier about uh, the intersection between fiction and nonfiction. I know I had some of my students read one of your essays from the New York Times, Disco Papa. And um, you were talking about how your brother writes nonfiction. And I'm curious if you could talk about the different ways that you either both handle similar, um, let's say, similar situations um, and how they might come out differently. Sure. Yeah, so my brother, shameless plug, is a nonfiction writer. He has a great book of sort of essays and memoir called I'm Sorry to Have Raised a Timid Son, which is his Daniel Boone quote. Um, that Daniel Boone said to his son after being cuckolded by his brother. It's a, it's a wonderful book sort of about thwarted masculinity, I think, different, different versions of American masculinity that kind of go awry. And um, it's wild to have a writer who's a brother uh, because I sort of think we're metabolizing some of the same stuff in totally different ways. So I wrote this novel, Swamplandia, and it's set kind of in my backyard in some mythic version of the Everglades. He also writes a ton about Florida. Um, and it's just the interesting kind of overlapping Venn diagram, right? He's very preoccupied with some of the same stuff, you know, family and loss. And um, But whereas he seems to feel honest, though he's most honest, just writing as himself under his own name, I can't imagine, I honestly can't imagine um, trying to write sort of historical nonfiction or, you know, write an essay about these or write like an ethnography or something, right? I think I just don't have that same... Um, I'm not wired that same way. Um, I, feel, I feel my most honest after I've already told everyone I'm lying, you know, and that sort of creates these parentheses where it feels somehow safe to tell the truth. Um, so, yeah, really just, just different impulses. But it is sort of funny to see, you know, our father as a character in this book is, is disorienting for me. And to realize that that person is not the father that I grew up with, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys all know this from your own families. But it's wild to have, a doc have it documented in this way. Um, sort of like seeing a photograph of someone who you know, but you've never seen them at that angle. They look like a stranger. That was my experience of reading the book. My real life sister just sent me an email where she's like, dear sister, please stop writing about sisters. Love your sister. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, you're clearly not Japanese. And nor were you alive during the Meiji era. Um, in writing this, I'm like, um, I'm like, you're wrong on both counts. So, <laughs> it's tonight um, that I reveal. You know, <laughs> in, in writing this story, though, um, it would be obvious that you had to do research. Uh, where did you find the balance between what you would include in the story, and yeah. um, where did you decide just how much you could include, and keeping it fiction? as opposed to historical fiction or even just yeah. historic? That's a, great, that's a great question. This is a balance that I'm still myself trying to learn how to achieve, right? There are writers like Jim Shepard and Andrea Barrett where they do copious research. They'll have, you know, pages of notes, and you really feel like they've so assimilated that information 
and the research, you know, it's not sort of like here are blocks of exposition about, you know, um, you know, whatever period they're writing about. It's really uh, essential to the story if it's there at all. I don't know that I've quite, I'm, I'm still sort of trying to figure out how to balance first how not to turn research into endless procrastination. I don't know if you guys can relate, but um, yeah, that research can become synonymous with just going down the internet wormhole <laughs> of no return. Um, with this story, I read this great, uh, this great book by a sociologist about factory girls and protest movements. And there was so much that was fascinating to me that ended up not being, not belonging in this story. But I mean, they have all, like a history of protest songs. A huge part of the way that they campaign for rights is these like gorgeous songs that they all co-authored. You know, that's not really in there. Um, all kinds of stuff about sort of the the larger, like the macro scale transformation that I thought was so interesting, but in the end kind of got um, got sifted out. With this novel, Swamplandia, I, the story I like best is I learned all these alligator facts, right? Because they are sort of fascinating. And I really wanted to have this scene, like a mating scene. And my editor, who's very kind and patient, but finally was like, this is an interesting thing. Watch it on YouTube. Don't tell us about it. She's like, it furthers nothing. You know, or I wanted, I thought metaphorically it was so cool. They swallow these stones to get the right hydrostatic balance in the water. She's like, that is so interesting. What a beautiful metaphor for something. Get it out of this book. You know, it was just like, so learning to be kind of ruthless with that stuff. Because I think it can be really tempting, right? You learn a cool fact and you want to just sort of stitch it in there. Um, so being, being disciplined about sort of including the things that further the plot or reveal something about the character belong in the story and not just like Snapple bottle fun fact. I like this moment where people come forward. Yeah. <laughs> it feels I was like a little nervous. So coming. formal. No, I feel like I should like, I don't know. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, it sort of speaks to what you were just talking about, the, uh, the incorporation of like the supernatural into your, specifically like your short fiction. Um, I really enjoyed The Prospectors and Haunting Olivia. And I'm wondering, you know, when you write those, is that something you decide from the beginning? Like, let me incorporate supernatural? Or is that something that like, is there ever a story where you're like, it's not working, let me leave it out? Yeah, often that happens. Um, so what, So usually for me, the weird there will be one weird thing. And this is a lesson I offer to you that's going to sound obvious, but Ben Marcus, who was a professor of mine early in my writing life, was like, you know, I just have to say, blue doesn't stand out on blue. And I thought this was really helpful, you know, in terms of thinking about the, the Kansas-Oz ratio, right, sort of your terrestrial... What what is what's going to be what's the realism in your story? Is it an emotional realism, and you're going to have some supernatural element or some some dilation to sort of reveal something that is true? But basically, he was saying, if there's not a rule governed consistent universe, no one is going to care about what's happening in your story. So if it's in Detroit, if it's in Mars, you better find a way to represent a reality that people recognize as true, and you know, human nature interacting with an environment in a way that is realistic, right? So even so something like Haunting Olivia, that started out in the dumbest way imaginable, where I was like, what if there were goggles that let you see ghosts? I was a camp counselor at this time, and they all pitied me, and no one responded to my um, uh, you know, whimsical what if. Um, but I just kept thinking about that, sort of like how the ocean is likely haunted, you know, certainly, because it's, and it is sort of the best analog we've got for the unconscious, right? So I wanted, I thought, I had no idea going into that story about what that sort of conceit was going to reveal. And it wound up that they're looking for the ghost of their dead sister. As per my sister's, you know, sister, please stop <laughs> writing about sisters. Um, so I think, I think often I'll have some kind of constraint or some, something. You know, the prospectors, I, I really I, uh, sort of knew going in that this would be an inversion of a ghost story. Um, but I'll, always stuff is revealed to you in the drafting process, right? And I was saying this afternoon, I, I've had lots of stories that don't ever take off or work at all, and I think it's because there's no genuine question inside them. They never become a vessel to kind of think through something larger. So if it had just been, what if these kids had underwater goggles and they, I don't know, looked for treasure or something, you know, something flat that didn't have uh, some subterranean thing going on, I don't think I, that story wouldn't have worked. Um, But it doesn't tend to go the other way. It's not like, it's never like I, I think I'm going to write a ghost story and it ends up being about tax accountants or something, you know? It's, it's, that's, that's yet to happen.
right. That is like super intense. I know. I get so excited. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> um, so I'm in a class that we're studying your work right now, actually with Professor Stanbook back there. Thank you. And um, it's really, really amazing. And we just finished reading a couple stories from St. Lucie's Home for Girls, Raised by Werewolves. So my question was, most of the stories that we read um, all have like young female protagonists, like usually going through like puberty. Or, like, Some are effeminate boys. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Most of them, yeah, most of the ones we touched on were like were girls. But so I guess I was just wondering like why or what draws you to these like you know twelve ish age girls like younger yeah. going through like that phase in life, or is it just like what happens to come to you? I think I really think that it's sort of at the time that I was writing that book, I was in my early twenties, so I, I had the perspective a little bit of perspective on childhood, it still seemed totally shocking to me. You know, you there it was in the side mirror, you know, and I I, I think I had um, just a little bit of, yeah, a little, a little bit more of an ability to really see what it had been like to be a child. You know, when you're kind of, when you're in the suck, what do you really know? Not that much. You're just trying to get to Saturday. So that was, I think, part of, in part it was just because those were the voices that I could make. Flannery O'Connor has another great quote where she says, you, you can't control what you make live. That's, that was what I could make live at that time. And I was excited with some of the more recent stories to be incrementally edging characters up in age. You know, I have like some dead char- dead adult characters, but that feels like a cop out. Um, so I actually think the most experimental thing I've written to date was this story just about um, uh, just a masseuse, like a masseuse in Wisconsin. And she doesn't, she doesn't have green wings, she doesn't have a brain tumor, she's just an adult woman in Wisconsin. And that felt like a real stretch to me. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. A little bit it feels like I'm going to be accused of something, like I'm no. marshalling all these defenses. Well, what I was just going to say is I'm glad that you, at the ending of the book was on a positive note because I always like my little stories tied up because life is so uh, difficult to navigate. So I like to read and get out of real life a little bit, but I don't like to have a horrible story, but at least you ended it on a very nice positive note. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm optimistic for them. I mean, they did lose quite a bit. Let's you know, it's a, um, the news is mixed for these, <laughs> you know, silkworm girls. But uh, yeah, I'm optimistic. We'll see. We'll see what they become when they get out of there. Um, um. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.